Hello and welcome to another NGen Math 7 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we're going to be doing Unit 8, Lesson 1, on probability terminology. So this whole unit is on probability, which is a fantastic and really cool branch of mathematics. It's one of the major branches along with algebra and geometry and trigonometry, which you haven't even heard of yet. You know, it's a really, really cool branch of math and very different than almost any of the other ones. So let's kind of jump into it right away. All right, probability measures the likelihood that something will happen. So there's a lot of things in math that we're just sort of like, well, how far will that projectile fly? Or, you know, how many of these things do I have to sell to make this much money? And things like that, right? Things that are definitive, things that will definitely happen. But there's a lot of times in the world, right, whether we're talking about weather or, you know, like the probability of like making a free throw in a basketball game or something like that, where the outcome isn't guaranteed. There's not a 100% chance that something is going to happen, right? And in that case, what happens is we bring in probability. Now, it's often measured, probability is often measured as a ratio of equally likely outcomes. Equally likely outcomes meaning that each one of them has the exactly the same chance as all the other ones of happening. And that's a very important piece of terminology, equally likely outcomes. So let's jump right into it and learn some terminology in exercise number one. Let's take a look. A board game contains a spinner that is divided into 10 equally sized sections as shown below. If the needle is spun just once, find the following probabilities as fractions. All right, so let's talk about this. It's really critically important when we do this problem that all of these sections are the same size because obviously if one was much larger or smaller than the other then it wouldn't be as equally likely that it would fall on let's say the 10 as it would on the 6 right but because these are all the same size when I hit the spinner right and it goes around and around and around and it finally lands on something then what happens right is that it will it, it has an equally likely chance of landing on any one of these numbers as any other one all right now my spinner at least uh, is not an equally likely outcome because it always ends up on seven due to my inability to properly animate stuff but regardless of that you get the idea all right now there's 10 possibilities for where that spinner could land and in letter a we want to find the probability that it lands on a number less than five right well in that case of those 10 possibilities, right, one, two, three, or four would fall into this category of being less than five. So there are four out of 10 equally likely outcomes that fall into our category. So we would say that the probability, which we oftentimes use a capital P for, is four tenths. And that's not a bad way to leave your probability. Now I know that we're, we're really used to taking a fraction and simplifying it, right? Reducing it to simplest terms, okay? So it's also okay to write it as two-fifths, all right? A lot of teachers actually prefer that it be left as four-tenths because then you can literally see all of the possible outcomes, 10 of them, and how many of them fit into the category that we're talking about, which is four of them. So the probability is four tenths. You'll even see a lot of people within probability look at this fraction and not call it four tenths, but literally call it four out of 10, four out of 10, right? Because that's the case, right? Four out of 10 or 40%, right? 40% of the outcomes fall into the category of being less than five. All right, let's talk about the probability that it lands on a multiple of three. Right? So what, what are some multiples of three? Well, three is a multiple of three because that's three times one. Six is a multiple of three and nine is a multiple of three. So there are three out of 10 equally likely outcomes that fall into our category. So we say that the probability is three tenths. Now, just as an aside, even though the problem never asks about it, right? If I said to you, is it more likely that the spinner would land on a number less than five or on a multiple of three? Well, you'd say it's more likely that it would land on a number less than five because four tenths is larger than three tenths. It's that simple, right? Now, letter C, it lands on a number greater than 10. 
Now this is very, very important, right? You know, we could talk about the probability that I'm gonna wake up tomorrow and get to play in the NBA, uh, and that probability would be zero. Not only because the NBA currently has suspended all of their games, but also because I'm just not that good of a basketball player, right? And the plain fact is, no matter how many times I spin the spinner, no matter how many times I let it go around in the circle, it is never gonna land on something greater than 10. There are no possibilities there. So the probability there is zero out of 10. And quite frankly, you know, zero divided by 10 is zero. I, I would prefer my students to say the probability that it's gonna land on a number greater than 10 is zero, right? All probabilities lie between the number zero and the number one. And they could be zero or one, all right? So like the probability that it's gonna land on a number less than 11, that's 10 out of 10, which is equal to the number one, right? So when you have a probability that something is definitely gonna happen, well then that probability is one. If, you, if it's impossible, then the probability is zero. Everything else is in between, like three tenths, four tenths, one half, et cetera. All right, so let's learn some more important terminology. The big piece from here is the idea of equally likely outcomes, equally likely outcomes. So let's keep playing around with probability terminology. Now there's a lot of terminology in probability and that's because we want to try to kind of keep things straight in our head. Probability can be what I call very slippery mathematics. It can be very confusing, all right? So let's continue on with our spinner and exercise number two. Consider the spinner above and the probability that the needle lands on a prime number, all right? Letter A, each number the needle could land on represents an equally likely outcome. Why? All right, so first piece of terminology, equally likely outcome. Every one of these numbers represents an equally likely outcome. Why is that? Pause the video now and try to write something down. Well, it's because all of the sections are the same size. That's simple. All the sections are the same size. Again, imagine, imagine sort of like, like a situation where you had a spinner, still 10 sections, but maybe like section number one is huge. Maybe it takes up literally like half the space and the other nine take up the other half of the space. They would then not be equally likely outcomes, at least not, you know, for landing in number one. All right, let's take a look at letter B. All of the equally likely outcomes that can occur is called the sample space. List the sample space below. So that's another very important piece of terminology, the sample space. Those are everything that is equally likely to happen. Now in this case, the sample space is a little silly to list and we almost always list it using what's called set notation, all right? A set is kind of given in these curly brackets and literally all the equally likely outcomes are just the whole numbers between one and 10. Now that's a very, easy example of a sample space. We're gonna to get to more complicated ones in future lessons, but in this lesson, it's easy. Those are all the equally likely outcomes that could occur, done, and there's 10 of them, and that matters. So let's keep, let's keep taking a look. We've got our spinner down here as well. Let me just kind of move this out of the way so that we can see it. You will need your calculators a little bit for today, so make sure that you have them handy. Take a look at letter C. Something like the needle falling on a prime number is called an event. List all the outcomes in the sample space that fall into the event of landing on a prime. And just to make sure we understand this idea of an event, okay? An event is something we find the probability of. So the probability it rains tomorrow. It rains tomorrow is the event. In the last exercise, we looked at the probability that the spinner would land on a number less than five. So landing on a number less than five is an event. An event is just Something that happens. That's it, right? Now in this case, we're looking at the event that the spinner lands on a prime number, all right? And what we wanna do is we wanna list every single one of these equally likely outcomes that falls into that event. Well, for that, you have to know what prime numbers are, and you've been studying those for a few years. But remember, the number one is not prime. But besides the number one, you can tell a prime number if it has no divisors other than the number one and itself, all right? So 
The number two is prime, the number three is prime, five is prime, seven is prime, and none of the other numbers are prime. So the set that contains all the equally likely outcomes in our event is this, two, three, five, and seven. All right, finally, letter D, what is the probability the needle lands on a prime number expressed as a fraction, a decimal, and a percent? Because all three ways are ways that we express probability, right? This, this big overarching idea in math seven, decimals, fractions, and percents are different ways of expressing the same thing. So the probability that it lands on a prime number is four out of 10, right? So the fraction would be four tenths. You could also write four tenths as, as two fifths, that would be fine. Although I really like it as four tenths because then the decimal is very easy, right? The decimal would be 0 0.4, right? Just think about dividing four by 10 or do it on your calculator. And then of course, converting this into a percent is also e easy. That is 40%. And all of those are very, very common ways of expressing probabilities. Now honestly, the two most sort of like common ways that you'll have to deal with is expressing probabilities as a fraction and expressing them as a percent. And you've seen probabilities expressed as percents all the time, right? When you wake up and you say, hey man, is it gonna rain tomorrow? And then you look at like some weather app or something like that and you see that there's a 70% chance of rain tomorrow, right? Well, that's a probability, right? 70% chance. Probability measures chance and probability specifically measures chance for us by taking a look at all of the outcomes that lie in the event that we care about, right? compared to all of the equally likely outcomes that are in the sample space. All right, very important terminology, equally likely outcomes, the sample space, which is a list of all the equally likely outcomes, an event, something that we're you know, trying to find the probability of, and then all the equally likely outcomes that fall in that event. So let's formally define probability based on those ideas. Probability definition. Let E be an event, something that happens, <laughs> just anything. You know what I mean? I win the lottery, that's an event. That'd be awesome. Of course, if I did win the lottery, I might not be standing in front of the camera right now, but who knows, maybe I would. And let S be the sample space of equally likely outcomes. The probability of E happening, which you oftentimes write with a capital P, parentheses, and whatever the event is, right, is simply the outcomes from the sample space that lie in the event that we care about, right? So that, you know, just how many of them there are divided by the total outcomes in the sample space. So in that last exercise, right, our event was the spinner landing on a, um, on a prime number, sorry. There were four outcomes from our sample space that lied in that particular event divided by 10 total outcomes. So we had a probability of four tenths or 40%. Now, again, we, we can do these kind of probabilities without having to you know, spin a spinner or anything like that. Let's take a look at one where we're given a table to work with. Exercise number three. A local pet shelter has cats and dogs in it, some of which have gotten vaccinated and some have not. The table below shows the numbers of each. A single animal is picked from the shelter at random, meaning all pets are equally likely to be chosen. Find each of the following probabilities expressed as a fraction, a decimal, and a percent. All right, so keep in mind, right, that there are a total of 40 animals in this pet shelter. And the idea is if I just kind of closed my eyes and I reached out and I grabbed a pet, which might not be wise because I might get bit or scratched or something, but you know, I reach out, I grab a pet, right? Now I want to find the probabilities. And I'm not going to list out the sample space. The sample space is all 40 pets. That's, that, that's the sample space. There's 40 of them that I'm choosing from, right? So let's figure out the probability that the animal is vaccinated. Let's do that one together and then have you work on some of the other ones on your own. Well, how many animals, how many of these 40 have been vaccinated? Well, there are 30 that fit into our event. Right, so maybe I'll, I'll say the probability that they're vaccinated, right, is gonna be the number that are vaccinated out of the 40, and that's 30, 
stroke divided by 40. So there's a nice fraction, right, that represents our probability. 30 fortieths. You could definitely reduce that to three fourths if you wanted to, all right? Now, in order to come up with the decimal, right, we could do some fun and games and things like that, right? And this decimal is pretty easy, but of course, we can always find the decimal version of a fraction pretty quickly on our calculator by just doing the numerator divided by the denominator. And again, in this case, hopefully, you wouldn't necessarily need your calculator to know that that's 0 0.75, but hey, if you need it, you need it, and do and use your calculator wisely. So, right, our fraction ratio, 30 fortieths, our decimal, 0 0.75, and of course, our percent, 75%, right? So there's actually a pretty good chance that if we picked an animal at random from this shelter, it would be vaccinated. 75% chance, right? The, the, the highest percent chance we can have is 100%, right? If you were told that there was a 100% chance it was going to rain tomorrow, right, then that means it's going to rain tomorrow. That's what 100% chance means. It means it's guaranteed. All right, so now let's take a look at the probability the animal is a cat and in C, the probability the animal is a cat that has not been vaccinated. So pause the video now and see if you can find these two probabilities. Again, I'd like them in fraction form, decimal form, and percent form. Pause the video now and take a few minutes. All right, well, let's see. I just want to know the probability the animal is a cat. Well, how many of my totally equally likely outcomes, right, 40 of them, fall into the category of being a cat? Well, that would be 24. So the probability that the animal chosen at random is a cat would be 24 fortieths. Again, there's nothing wrong if you decide to reduce that fraction. Um, if, of course, you're told you must reduce it, then obviously reduce it. But in most cases, in probability, you don't have to. Now, the decimal version, which you can barely see on here, but when we went to the screen, hopefully you saw it, was 0 0.6, right? So that is the decimal version of that fraction. And that then should be easy enough to say 60%. Remember, if you're struggling at all turning a decimal into a percent. If this is any problem for you at all, if you think, oh man, I might accidentally say that that's 6% or 0.6% or something, never, it never hurts to take your fraction, convert it into a decimal, and then take that answer and multiply by 100. As soon as you take the decimal version and you multiply by 100, then you'll have that percent, in this case, 60%. So, it is, by the way, less likely that if we chose an animal at random that it would be a cat, then it would be vaccinated, right? There's a 75% chance that if I picked an animal at random, it would be vaccinated. There's only a 60% chance that it would be a cat. Now, the final one said, what is the probability that an animal that has, I'm sorry, that the animal is a cat that hasn't been vaccinated? Well, again, the total number of outcomes are 40. How many of them are cats that haven't been vaccinated? Well, that would be six, right? Here are my cats. 18 vaccinated, six not vaccinated. So the probability the animal is a cat that has not been vaccinated is going to be six out of 40, or six fortieths. There's our fraction. Our decimal now, six divided by 40, is 0 0.15. And, of course, that then gives us a percent of 15%. And this is important, you know, because let, let's say, I mean, granted, if you went to a pet shelter to choose a pet, you probably wouldn't do it at random. But if you really wanted a cat, you know, or you picked an animal and it was a cat, and you were worried about whether or not it was vaccinated or not vaccinated, right? Hopefully they would have records on that, but there's only a 15% chance that you're going to pick a cat that is not vaccinated, all right? That's if you just pick a random animal, a dog, a cat, whatever. 15% chance it's gonna be a cat that's not vaccinated. Pretty low in the grander scheme of things. All right, so let's take a look at one more. Now, I've been kind of hinting at this the entire time. Probability is exceptionally important because what we're trying to do is we're trying to put a number on how likely something is to happen, 
right? How likely is it that the following thing will happen? And then it's up to us as people to decide whether or not that risk, if you will, is worth it to do something, right? Probability is oftentimes used to make decisions based on how likely something is to happen. So let's take a look at one last exercise that sort of forces that issue. Exercise number four. The final round on a game show allows a contestant to choose two options. Pick one of three doors, one of which has $1,000 behind it, or spin a needle to see if it will land on one of the two $1,000 sections. Which should the contestant choose and why? All right, now keep in mind, just so that you don't think differently, it's not like the doors are gonna actually have the amounts labeled on them. Because if that's the case, then for goodness sakes, just open up this door and take the $1,000. The idea is that there's three doors, I don't know which one has the $1,000 behind it, and I just gotta open one up, and if it's got the thousand, I win it, and if it's got one of the two zeros, I win that as well which isn't much money. And the same thing with the spinner. I'm just gonna let that spinner go, right? It's gonna go around and around and around, and if it lands on one of the two that says 1,000, I win 1,000, and if it lands on one of them that says zero, I don't win that at all, right? So the question is, which one should I go for? Should I use the door, or should I go for the spinner? I'd like you to pause the video now and see if you can make a decision based on probability. All right, well, un unless something strange is happening, right? Uh, you wanna win the money, right? <laughs> you wanna win the $1,000, okay? And, and it's good that they're both $1,000 that you're possibly gonna win because quite frankly, if this was a million and this was a thousand, I'm gonna go for the million even if it's a lower chance. If it's a lower chance. So let's talk about how likely it is that you'll win if you go with the doors, right? So if you go with the door, well, the probability you're gonna win there is only one door out of three that will allow you to win, so the probability is one-third, right? Over here, what we've got is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven equally likely sectors, right? And of those, two of them fall into the category of winning, right? So in this case, we've got the probability of winning is two sevens. Now, this is what kind of makes this problem a little more interesting. If the denominators were the same here, right, then it would be straightforward. We could just say, ah, oh, we should go with this one because there's just more of a chance, right? But now we're comparing a probability of one-third to a probability of two-sevenths. And there's a bunch of different ways you could do this. One way you could do it is by converting both of them to percents. And that may be the most natural thing for you to do. If you took this one and converted it to a percent, that's pretty easy. I'm just going to write that one down, it would be 33 and a third with the three repeated percent, 33.3 .3 repeated percent. All right, not, not bad, right? Two sevenths, that's a little bit more tricky. That one I might actually want my calculator out on and I'll just kind of quickly do two divided by seven. All right, maybe I'll change that into a percent by multiplying by 100. So in this case, um, the probability of winning would be uh, 28, and I'm gonna round it just to the nearest tenth. That's good enough, 28.6%. Okay, and maybe I'll get rid of the bar there and just round it to 33.3%. So now what we see, right, is that the probability of opening up a door, right, and winning the money, 33.3%, is slightly more, slightly more, than the probability of winning if I spin the spinner, right? And that's a little bit counterintuitive because there's only one door you can open to win, and yet there are two of these equally sized sectors over here that you can use to win. But the plain fact is you're still gonna win a higher percentage of the time here than you are here. So I'm gonna go with the door, or the doors, because the probability of winning of winning is larger. Now, by the way, if you really, really love fractions, and there's probably a pretty low probability of that, but if you really love fractions, another way of comparing these two probabilities is get them to have a common denominator. 
All right, then it's relatively easy to really compare because then you're comparing kind of apples to apples. So for instance, if I looked at the fraction 1 3rd and 2 7 I could get them both to have a denominator of 21. That is their least common denominator. So for instance, this one would have a denominator of 21 if I multiplied the numerator and denominator by 7. So 1 3rd is the same as 7 21ths, right, or 7 out of 21. On the other hand, 2 7 right, if I multiplied both top and bottom here by 3, right, then what I would get is I'd get 6 21ths, right? So another way to do it is to convert each one of the fractions so that they have the same denominator, and then it's pretty easy to say, well, 7 out of 21 is a higher probability, just slightly, than 6 out of 21, and therefore the doors are a better choice. It's still the same reason, though, the doors, because the probability of winning is larger. Right? Whether you do it with percents or whether you do it with fractions doesn't make any difference. Now, I'm a big fan of percents. I just like percents. Right? It's real simple to think about the fact that 0% chance of happening means it's not going to happen. And 100% chance of something happening means it's guaranteed. There's a 100% chance that the Knicks are not going to make the NBA Finals this year. Partly because the NBA is no longer playing games and partly because they're the Knicks. They're my favorite team, okay? I'm not knocking on the Knicks. Actually, I am, but they're still my favorite team. Anyway, let's move on. Let's wrap this up. So we're going to be doing a lot of work with, obviously, probability throughout Unit 8, given that it's probability. And we want to have a common language, right? A language that we can use then to kind of get a grasp on this somewhat tricky branch of mathematics. Today, what we reviewed was the idea of an equally likely outcome. And then what we introduced that was new, something that you didn't see in Math 6, were things like the sample space. That's all the equally likely outcomes that could possibly happen, right? And then there are events. Those are just simply the things that we're trying to find the probability of. And then the idea of the very definition of probability, the ratio of how many equally likely outcomes fall in our event to how many total equally likely outcomes there are. That's a mouthful. Anyway, we're going to get a lot more work on these as we start to work with what are called compound events in future lessons. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another NGen Math 7 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.